Good evening, everybody, and welcome. I, my name is Father Snyder. I'm the pastor here at St. Lad's, and I just want to welcome you and thank you so much for taking time out of your Sunday to be with us. You know, the, the Christian ethics is told to us by our God that says there's only two commandments. You love God, and you love your neighbor as you love yourself. And that's really the focus of this gathering this panel. How well do we love one another? How well can we love ourselves in order that we can indeed ultimately love our God? So I hope tonight we only we not only give you some insights, but we also give you some ways and ideas of how better to fulfill that call, that command of our God, of loving God, neighbor, and self. I have to thank very much uh, our deacon, John Travis, who has worked very hard to put this together, and really, I think, was, along with our Adult Faith Formation Committee, the impetus of having this conference. So while I welcome you and hope you'll stay around, not only afterwards for some fellowship, but maybe to get to know each other, I'd like to introduce you now to Deacon John Travis, who will introduce the panel and get us underway. Thank you, Father. Again, welcome. Um, this event was in part inspired by a 75-year study from Harvard. And that study explored what makes people joyful and happy and healthy. Many people think that money or fame lead to those things, but this study came to a different conclusion. In 1938, Harvard University researchers began tracking the lives of 724 men. About half of the men were sophomores from Harvard. The other half came from Boston's poorest neighborhoods. Every two years, the researchers not only interviewed the men and their families, but also got their medical records, drew their blood, did brain scans, so they had objective information about their health. As the study went on, Many of the men from the poor neighborhoods asked, why are you still studying me? My life just isn't that interesting. The Harvard men never asked that question. <laughs> the key finding was that while fame or hard work doesn't lead to more fulfilled lives, the people who are happiest and healthiest have good relationships. It turns out that social connections are really good for us. And in fact, loneliness can kill. The study also revealed that the number of friends is not that important. It's the quality of the relationship that matters. And finally, those who can count on others in time of need are protected in, in mind and body. Those people who have friends are more resilient, have healthier bodies, and are emotionally more resilient and able to withstand the ups and downs of life and actually have greater cognitive skills than those who are lonely and have no relationships. So this uh, evening, we're going to discuss how relationships in our families, in school, at work, in our religious lives can result in more joy and better health. We have an all-star panel here, and we're going to start from that end, moving to this way. Uh, you should have this brochure which uh, kind of outlines what we're going to do this evening. And on the right, you'll see some detailed biographies of our four speakers. But briefly, Maria Lawton is a family and marriage therapist. Diane Corgan, who will be speaking after Maria, is an educator from Cleveland State. Stephanie Cruz is a human resource professional. And Greg Noveski, to my immediate right, is a deacon and psychiatrist. They'll each make a presentation. And as they're speaking, we, we invite you to write down some questions. We're going to take questions after Greg is done speaking. And volunteers will be collecting the cards from time to time. They'll bring them up to me, and then we'll pose questions to the various speakers. You can direct it to a particular presenter or the panel as a whole. And uh, we'll pose as many questions to our panelists as time allows. And at the end of the event, we're going to ask you to fill out a short evaluation so we can learn from this and do an even better job next time around. 
And at about 8.30, we'll go over to Cullen Hall, all the presenters. We'll hope we can have some good fellowship, companionship, relationship building, and enjoy some refreshments. Uh, there are restrooms, by the way, out that way uh, and to the right, and there are some restrooms in the back in the cry rooms as well if you happen to need those. So uh, let's begin now, and we'll uh, ask our first speaker, Maria Lawton, to talk to us about family relationships. Okay. Everybody hear me. Make sure I've never worn one of these. I usually hold the mic. Can we hear me? Okay, good evening. I am Maria Lawton, marriage and family therapist. So happy to see all of you guys brave the snowy roads this evening. I'm impressed. I thought it would make sense to kind of talk about a little bit as, as we start is what is joy? Um, it's different from happiness. Joy is an emotion that is evoked by well-being, success, or good fortune, or by the prospect of possessing what one desires, also known as delight, an emotion comprised of happiness, contentment, and harmony. It's different from happiness in that it's not caused by a particular event, but comes from within the individual. So as a marriage and family therapist, I usually see people at a time where they're in crisis. Many complain about feelings of depression, anxiety, they struggle with substance abuse issues, or even suicidal thoughts. They're not certain all the time of why they're struggling and are often taking medications to manage their symptoms. It would be safe to say that about 75% of the people that I work with are either on antidepressant or anti-anxiety medications. Most of them seem to report that it's not working, we're not very effective in managing their symptoms or improving them. It's just curious to me how so many people are suffering or lacking joy out there, and then they turn to a medication for relief with little to no help. Why is this happening? So today I'm gonna to present to you my thoughts and perspectives on the reasons this might be happening from a relational standpoint. As a marriage and family therapist, I am first going to look at the quality of the relationships in my clients' lives with those that matter most to them, their spouses, their children, extended family, and friends. As I present this perspective, please keep in mind that I absolutely value and respect the validity of legitimate diagnoses and mental health issues. The lens through which I see things happens to be focused on relationships and the impact that they have on our lives. So before I get into a specific case, I'd like to share with you all some interesting knowledge that I obtained through research on this subject. I'm sure many of you are familiar with Charles Darwin and his theory of evolution. He's most known for the phrase, survival of the fittest. So what survival of the fittest implies is that the people that are the most powerful, resilient, fastest, biggest, or self-sufficient are the ones that are gonna live the longest or have the most success. Well, guess what? Charles Darwin never said that. I was shocked when I found that out. I was like, what? Everybody knows him for that. Nope, that was a mistake. A man by the name of Herbert Spencer who was the commentator for Darwin, is the one who coined that phrase. What Darwin believed was something very different. His theory was based in the idea that evolution is set up for the survival of the most nurtured and the most connected. So what I would like to do, if I could ask Mr. Hurdle, my longtime friend over there, to show us all a video that expands on this idea um, of survival of the most nurtured and connected. Babies this young are extremely responsive to the emotions and the reactivity and the social interaction that they get from the world around them. This is something that we started studying oh, 30, 40 years ago when people didn't think that infants could engage in social interaction. In the still face experiment, what the mother did was she sits down and she's playing with her baby who's about a year of age. I need my girl. Oh. And she gives a greeting to the baby, the baby gives a greeting back to her. This baby starts pointing at different places in the world and the mother's trying to engage her and play with her. They're working to coordinate their emotions 
and their intentions, what they want to do in the world. And that's really what the baby is used to. And then we ask the mother to not respond to the baby. The baby very quickly picks up on this. And then she uses all of her abilities to try and get the mother back. She smiles at the mother. She points because she's used to the mother looking where she points. Yeah. The baby puts both hands up in front of her and says, what's happening here? She makes that screechy sound at the mother, like, come on, why aren't we doing this? Even in this two minutes when they don't get the normal reaction, they react with negative emotions, they turn away, they feel the stress of it, they actually may lose control of their posture because of the stress that they're experiencing. Okay. I'm here. And what are you doing? Oh, yes. Oh, what a good girl. It's a little like the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good is that normal stuff that goes on, that we all do with our kids. The bad is when something bad happens but the infant can overcome it. After all, when you stop the still face, the mother and the baby start to play again. The ugly is when you don't give the child any chance to get back to the good. There's no reparation, and they're stuck in that really ugly situation. I'm sorry I put you through that. I could see some of you cringing as I did. It's hard to watch, I know. When, when the mother becomes unavailable, you see the baby start to get stuck in the ugly. Um, what I, the things we do for research, huh, in theory. Um, so the video is, it's based on a concept called co-regulation. And what it's showing is that co-regulation is, is applied specifically in the context of emotions and how the emotions of each individual within a partnership or a dyad are constantly in flux depending on the emotions or behaviors of the partner. So what I love about that video is that it shows that we are hardwired or created by God for connection. That, that baby doesn't know any different, right? So it's this instinctive feeling. Um, we are created to use our connections with other people, particularly those closest to us, as the ultimate resource for regulating our emotions. So attempting to self-soothe, self-regulate, or even medicate our emotions may not be as effective. This expands on the notion of survival of the most nurtured and connected, as we see what happens to the baby when she's deprived from emotional connection from her mother. Whether it is the baby shown in this video or any individual at any age, when they are deprived of the need to feel securely, emotionally attached or connected to somebody, they protest. You saw the baby protest, and if you start paying attention, you can see adult protest or become stuck in the ugly. This protest comes from an inherent or God-given need and expectation that questions, are you there for me? Can I count on you? Do my feelings matter to you? And are you accessible, responsive, and engaged? Okay, so now that I've provided some basis or theory for the idea that joy comes from securely, emotionally connected relationships, I would like to share with you a case that I was presented with early in my career. For the sake of this discussion and to protect identity, we'll call him Chris. Chris was a 22-year-old young man who had been in therapy since the age of eight. His file was about three inches thick, and it was filled with assessments and multiple diagnoses. He came from a high affluent family that was very career focused. This is not to imply they didn't deeply love or care for their son. They were just a bit disengaged and did not interact or play much with him. Over his years in therapy, Chris was diagnosed with ADHD, uh, Asperger's at the time, which is now referred to as like high-functioning autism, major depressive disorder, and even had two suicide attempts. He was prescribed several medications, including antidepressants and antipsychotic medication. 
His parents, like many others, were concerned and wondering, what is wrong with our son, and how do we fix him? After studying his history and meeting with him over several sessions weekly, I noticed he didn't have any close, connected relationships in his life. I asked him a very revealing question that I ask all the clients that I work with. Who do you go to when you need comfort, reassurance, or are sad or afraid or experience any of the emotions that life brings? Chris looked at me in sort of a confused way and said, no one. Soon after, he shared a traumatic experience he endured while in middle school. A group of boys he thought were his friends were horsing around, as boys often do, and then picked him up and threw him in a dumpster nearby. There he was, covered in garbage and feeling totally worthless and unwanted. It was soon after that I suspected the root cause of many of his symptoms was that he was completely isolated and deprived of emotional connection. As we got to know each other, I began to notice him feeling more comfortable and making more eye, more eye contact with me. He would even start to joke around or get excited to update me on the latest events in his life. I was so pleasantly surprised to see him engage in this manner. And then I realized, he was fully capable of making emotional connections with people. We were connected. I looked at him after quite some time in therapy and finally had the courage to say to him, Chris, you know what? I don't think anything's wrong with you. And I also don't believe that you really have any of these diagnoses that you've been given. At first he looked surprised and then maybe a little bit relieved. He looked at me and said, I don't either. I never felt I had any of these diagnoses, but I was just believing what everyone was telling me. He then said the most profound words he had ever said in our work together up to this point. He looked at me and said, I think I'm just lonely. I agreed, and together we let out the new direction of his treatment. With guided care from his physician, we safely weaned him off all medications as we set forth a plan to begin building meaningful, connected relationships in his life. We worked on how to connect with others through meaningful dialogue that involves sharing personal things about yourself and also asking relevant questions about others. He even confronted those boys from middle school about the dumpster incident, only to find out they intended it as more of a playful yet daring hazing or initiation into their group of friends and not an implication of him being so worthless or disliked. Within a year, he formed a relationship with a steady girlfriend, moved into his first apartment with a new best friend, began going to concerts, trips to Europe, and various other social events with friends. In our less frequent sessions, I noticed his entire affect had changed. He was lighter, more engaged, laughed louder, and had much more to talk about. He now goes on and on about his weekly Wednesday dinners with his closest friends where they come to his house and cook a new creative meal together. It is amazing to witness his incredible transformation and safe to say he has finally found joy. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. We'll turn to uh, uh, Diane in a moment. Again, we have volunteers with uh, three by five cards, and uh, I'm going to ask that they stand up and walk around a little bit. And if you'd like a card and you want to write down a question, and we have pens as well. There, there are some pencils in the chairs in front of you underneath the seats. But if you have some questions, we're, we're, we've reserved a lot of time at the end to take questions from you. We want to uh, answer them. so. Uh, if anyone uh, wants to write out a question, raise your hand at some point. We'll give you a card. Make sure you have a pen. Diane? Good evening. Um, I'm Diane Corrigan, and I am a professor in the College of Education and Human Services at Cleveland State University. Um, to give you a little bit of context, am I close enough to the spot? Mm -hmm. There we go. Um, Diane, here's your target right here. Yes. That's just a visual. Oh, to that one. Great. I'll point it there. Thanks, Bob. Um, to 
give you an idea of where I interact with students in the schools, in my school context. I teach in um, a program that is designed to, for teacher licensure. So candidates come preparing to be teachers um, in my program at the high school level. So I am primarily working in local high schools with my students, but I also um, am in a variety of elementary and middle schools as well. And to be honest, um, the real joy of my work is when I am out in the K-12 buildings rather than in um, the buildings at Cleveland State, but it's a great balance. Um, when we talk about relationships in schools, um, I think many of us have heard of the book, All I Really Needed to Know I Learned in Kindergarten, which shows how much emphasis we put on building relationships from the very beginning of the school relationship of our children. Um, Robert Fulgham talked about a number of processes or um, skills that children needed, um, basically playing nice in the sandbox. And we tried to teach this to our children at a very young age. And I find myself being reminded of these in many contexts. Maybe you have as well. Um, we hear about Robert Fulgham's book in social settings, um, in school settings. I've even heard a reference to it in homilies at um, church. So when we start with that foundation of having a solid relationship, as soon as we enter the school setting, um, it continues. And what I'm seeing today, the vocabulary changes a little, but we're teaching children the same thing. Um, we're referring it as social-emotional learning, um, basically how to get along. And the focus today in schools is on data and collecting data from children, as you know about testing in many ways. Um, we actually collect data about social-emotional learning. We ask children, do you feel safe in school? Um, are you happy in school? Do you have friends? Do your friends cheat? Um, do you trust your teachers? Um, do you, are your peers your friends? And school counselors, administrators, teachers are looking very carefully to see what their climate is. How are students getting along with each other? How are they relating to their teachers? and also trying to get some insight into what happens when they leave that school building. So we're consistently comparing this data. Um, you may have heard of schools um, with the International Baccalaureate Program. Um, again, I see this as another emphasis on the importance of values and character development. Um, the IB program, as International Baccalaureate is known, um, was initially designed not only as a very strenuous and rigorous academic program for students, but it's a character development program. It talks about respecting each other, becoming global citizens, talks about kindness, generosity, fairness, and it's all about how students relate to each other in their schools, in their communities, and globally. So it's definitely a key point of the curriculum beyond academics. Another program that I'm seeing that helps students focus on their relationships is peer me mediation. So many times we looked to counselors, parents, administrators to solve the problems. If there's a disagreement, if there's a fight, if there's a theft, um, you know it. It's a long laundry list. Um, instead of relying on adults, we're training students and children how to talk to each other, how to resolve their differences, how to come to solutions to the problems, and how to move forward. It's helping them not only build relationships, but build responsibility going into an adult world. When I talk with my students, and I specifically have a program that, if you read my bio, focuses on social justice in the schools. And so I'm teaching my students that they not only need to know their content area and be able to teach their content, they need to know their students and know them as members of communities and families. So we talk about how to relate 
as a teacher to a student. But it happens in relationships on many levels. Um, students are always watching us, if we're parents, if we're adults, if we're teachers. So what they are teaching, what I'm teaching them on how to relate to students, I'm also asking them to teach those same skills for students to relate to each other. Um, what works for adults works for students. And we need to be teaching them the skills that they can use when they go outside of our classroom doors. And then, if we're going to be good role models, we need to be using those same skills as teacher to teacher and teacher to other adults. So what are those skills? First of all, I talk about an ethic of care. In the field of education, we hear the sentence many times that students say, I don't care what you're teaching until I know that you care about me. These are children. It's all about them. It's all about me. And they need to know that you care about them as individuals, um, that you are looking out for them, that you have their best interest at heart, and that you want their success. Once you've built that foundation, then you could start to teach your content area. Um, I talked to my students about having one-to-one -one conversations. Um, I met with a group of high school students, and I asked them um, for advice for my future teachers. I said, what do they need to know that I'm forgetting to tell them? What do you know that I don't know? And I said, because I know there's a lot that goes on. And the one thing they told me, many things stood out, and later I'd be happy to share those with you. But the one thing they said is that if there's an issue, um, whether it's attendance, homework, a disagreement, cheating, whatever, they said, be sure to have that conversation one-on-one. -on -one. Because they say, if you have that conversation with a student in front of their peers, they said, I can tell you, your teacher will always lose. They said, I'm willing to risk my grade, my relationship with the teacher, even my presence in this school for my relationship with my peers. And if you're going to threaten that, know that you're going to lose. They said, but if you talk to me one-on-one, -on -one, I'm willing to listen, I'm willing to change, I'm willing to do better. I thought, what wonderful advice um, to remember to build our relationships one-on-one. -on -one. We're not trying to win over the whole bill, the whole peer group, the whole class at once. It's one relationship at a time. And that goes to my next point of time that relationships take time. Um, teachers are very busy with data, paperwork, grades, the act of teaching itself. But if they don't take time to demonstrate that ethic of care, the rest doesn't matter to students. It's how much time you're able to give them. And that time includes listening, not just talking. And I'm not being a good example of that right now because I'm spending all my time talking. But it's important to be on the other side and to listen to what students have to say. It'll save you a lot of talk if you listen to what they're thinking and where they are. Um, and again, I'm asking my teachers to teach these same skills to students so that they could develop stronger relationships with their peers. So I need to give them some taglines to do this. You know, I want them to remember what I say. So my program, we have three guidelines. The first is ask first. Don't judge your student. And again, pass this on to the peers. Don't judge your friend. Don't judge your parent. Don't judge your teacher. There's a lot going on in these students' lives. If they're late, it may not be because they don't want to be there, or they don't like your class, or they're trying to upset you. If they didn't do their homework, there may be a good reason for it. If they're sleeping or they don't put away their phone, none of those behaviors are acceptable. And I don't ask my teachers to accept them. But I do ask them to ask the student why they're happening so that they could give them the steps that they need to overcome whatever it is that's affecting their behavior and holding back their success. Um, how much easier to ask first rather than getting angry or imposing consequences or labels, as we just heard, um, that aren't necessary. 
The second is daily forgiveness. Um, students know how to push our buttons as teachers. Um, we get upset, we get angry. Um, there's a lot that goes on um, in high schools that I see that we need to forgive students. But they need to know that they could come back every morning and start fresh. They can succeed again, they could be welcomed again, they're always valued. Um, daily, um, we recognize forgiveness. And I ask students to forgive other students, forgive their friends. I think it's harder for a child to do that sometimes than it is for us, but we could model it, that every day we start fresh um, and no one has ever lost their value. The last one is no tourists. And this is nobody's just there riding on the bus, looking out the window, passing by. Everybody needs to be engaged. Everybody needs to participate, not only in a class discussion or in a group project, but in a relationship. You can't just sit by, stand back, watch everyone else. You need to put in the effort. You need to put in the investment. You have to get off the bus. You have to take all, you have to take the risk. And I want my teachers to feel safe doing that. Um, as I'm talking to my teachers, I'm talking to myself. I have to daily forgive them. I have to give them my time. I have to listen. I have to get off the bus and give them the time. Um, this particularly we talk about um, with the bullying that goes on in the schools. That's one of the questions in, um, on those social emotional learning surveys. Um, are students being bullied in this school? Do you know who the victims are? Do you know who the bullies are? Because all the research shows us that the answer is absolutely yes. Bullies do not want to ever perform their act in a vacuum or in a closet or with no one noticing. The research shows it's always for the attention well beyond what's happening to the victim. There's always a bystander there's always an adult, a child, someone on social media who knows before it's happening or why it's happening. And we've had way too many bystanders, way too many tourists that just stood by. Again, because of the peer group, because of not a fear of losing their peer group, the reasons are many. But now we focus on training upstanders, not bystanders. Stand up. Take the risk, defend your friends, inform an adult, inform anyone that you know can help. Don't be the tourist, don't be the bystander, be the one who takes a stance. So there's a new book out. We've moved from kindergarten into pre-K. Not going backwards, but knowing that we need to start earlier with our children. Um, we know they're growing up more quickly, right? They're in school earlier. So the new book is Fill a Bucket um, by two women, um, giving um, children a visual image and telling them that everyone, whether you're a preschooler all the way up to your adults, your teachers, your parents, your grandparents, all the persons you love and who love you, they all have a bucket. And in this bucket goes all the good things and feelings about ourselves. We could fill our bucket on our own but it's also really helpful if others help us fill the bucket and tell us all the good things we need to hear, all the things that are true, but maybe somebody forgot to say. And the authors tell us that by sharing our love, helping to fill someone else's bucket, we simultaneously fill our own. And as Deacon John started, if we have full buckets, we have positive relationships, and we have happy people. And one more point, as a teacher, I have to remember that we always have lifelong learning. And our lifelong learning comes in our relationship with God. It starts well before preschool. It starts at baptism. It starts at birth with God's gift of life and love. And parents nurture that relationship, family, friends, but we have a responsibility as adults for our own learning and for our children's learning. Um, the textbook is the Bible. They need to know the stories of the Bible, the characters of the Bible, the teachings of the Bible. They need to know Jesus. And that will be their lifelong relationship 
and that's what's going to give them the joy-filled relationship. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. We'll turn to Stephanie in a moment. I'm going to ask uh, volunteers Ellen and Judy, perhaps, just start passing out some cards in the middle of the row, and, the, and people can pass it down the way, and then we'll collect them on the outside aisles at some point. So I'd like you to have cards in hand as you uh, uh, hear the different uh, speakers so that you can start uh, jotting down notes and questions, if you like. Thank you. Stephanie? Can you move up the microphone a little bit? Or turn it on. That too. Can you hear me? How's that? All right. Sorry. Again, my name is Stephanie Cruz, and as John mentioned, I am an HR professional. Um, I currently work with uh, three generations. I'm sure a lot of you out there do. It's the baby boomer generation, Gen Xers, Gen Ys, or millennials. Um, each of these generations provides differences, likenesses, and challenges. That's okay. <clears throat> Sorry. I personally have spent most of my career working with the baby boomer generation, um, like Mr. Travis here, and have been guided by their wisdom, their work ethic. On the other hand, I've also worked for several years now with the Gen Y, or the millennial generation, and I've also learned so much from them. They are intuitive, technologically intelligent, more so than me, and are not afraid to ask for what they want. Of course, here's my generation, the Gen Xers, and we currently comprise the majority of the workforce, but as you can see, we're being quickly followed by the millennials. I think the Gen X generation has a unique role in being able to juggle the vast differences between the generation above us and the one below us. It is very interesting that the baby boomers are well-versed in mentoring the generations below them, and most have so much to offer. But I find it equally interesting that the Gen Y, or the millennials, can reverse mentor and share their vast knowledge of technology with their more tenured counterparts. Regardless of the generation you're from, being happy in your workplace is something we all want, and it is part of my job to help you get you there. One of my most favorite phrases is, you can catch more flies with honey than vinegar. I'm sure most of you have heard that. And in the world of HR, this is very important. We work with people, we must be people people. When talking to our staff or even observing, I often tell them that the more you go above and beyond in your daily work, the more you will be recognized by your boss and or the decision makers. The desire to do well for your company and boss and actually doing well will make you have a sense of fulfillment. How can we do that? A couple of examples. Say you answer a phone call at work. Um, it's very easy to just transfer that call and forget about it. What you can do is make sure the person on the other end answers that call and is able to help the caller. If not, you bring the call back. You offer to help if you can. If not, take a message. You've given that caller the personal touch to, your, to the customer. And it is a ladder that gets you noticed and will also give you the joy knowing you not only did your job, but you were useful to someone else, which can make you happy and give you a sense of fulfillment. Another very simple way to do a better job for your boss is to be responsive. Be known in your company as someone that can be relied on to respond to queries or requests. There are those that may receive an email, for example, asking for something, and if they do not have an answer at that time, they simply do not respond. The right thing to do is to acknowledge the request, say when I have an answer, I'll get back to you, and acknowledge that you're working on it. When going above and beyond, the intention may be to do the best you can in making your employer look good, but it also benefits you personally. Some other discussions I may have with individuals are it's your choice to be happy. You alone must make the choice to be happier and embrace the positives in every situation. There will always be challenges in one's work life. It is up to the individual to find happiness regardless of the negatives around you. Focus on all the good in your world and focus on what makes you happy. Being thankful. Be th being thankful for all that you have, all that you are, your friends, your family, your surroundings. We have all crossed paths with someone or multiple people in our journey that has offered us guidance, 
influence, lessons, and advice that has helped us grow professionally and personally. I bet each of you can think of one or more people that has directly influenced or has guided you on some level. Look at all you've accomplished and know that there are so many positives to be grateful for. Look at those moments, those lessons, and those opportunities to help through the rough patches and know that while there are rough patches, they too provide lessons. While it is difficult to appreciate it at the moment, those rough times should be embraced and recognized as stepping stones to your professional growth. Building relationships. There are going to be obstacles in your work career, and it is those times that one should lean on those positive relationships at both work and home. <clears throat> to help overcome the hurdles, make friends, invest in those friends, create a strong social circle and network. Get involved in their personal lives, know their kids' names, their hobbies, their activities, the sports that they're involved in. Trying to overcome a hurdle alone creates more resentment and more dissatisfaction. Engage in your work role. By spending your time and energy disliking your job, you create a toxic environment, one that dictates your level of happiness. Things can be so much easier if you spend your time and energy embracing the good and the positive. Focus on turning the negatives around. Some suggestions. Begin your day with something that makes you happy. Maybe a walk, a jog, yoga, sitting and reading the newspaper for 10 minutes, drinking a cup of coffee. And then think about something at your workplace that brings you joy. Perhaps you are fortunate enough to park in a covered garage, or the pens your company offers makes you happy. Um, or, like myself, I walk in every day to a happy receptionist who's always smiling and has a nice thing to say. Take that small joy and focus on it. Be grateful for work. The ability to provide for yourself and your family alone is joy. Plan to succeed at your workplace, and you can do that by always working to make your company look good. Go above and beyond in your role. Finally, know that we all have choices. You can choose to approach a bad day or challenge in a negative way, but you can also choose to face that challenge or change in a positive way. Being happy can be contagious, and exerting positive energy can create positivity all around you. Finding joy in the workplace requires that you figure out what drives you and what inspires you and put your energy into those things and build upon them. I want to share one more piece of information. I recently received my monthly health and wellness newsletter, and the topic of the month is heart health, obviously lining up with Valentine's Day. The title of the article is, A Positive Attitude is Good for Your Heart. The article talks about being optimistic, looking at the glass as half full versus half empty. Researchers from John Hopkins surmise that people who have a positive outlook may have more natural protection from the damaging effects of stress. So, being positive is not only good for your relationships, but it's also very good for your health. A few takeaways. Focus on people, excuse me. Look around, observe, have conversations, engage, take interest, and know the importance of human interaction. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. And uh, Deacon Noveski is uh, going to be talking to us about religious relationships, and he has a little uh, card that. Uh, Ellen Bex is passing out at his request. So we ask that you take uh, some of these cards with you, please. Greg? Can you hear me? Is it okay? Good, good. I'd like to thank you all for coming this evening, particularly on such a, you know, kind of a snowy evening, kind of slick outside when we were coming over here. And I'd particularly like to thank Father Don and Deacon John for the invitation to come here to speak with you. Um, I began talking with uh, John about this some months ago, and he said, well, the topic's going to be finding joy, and you're going to have 10 minutes. <laughs> and I began thinking, I, I've looked for, looked for my glasses trying to find them longer than 10 minutes. <laughs> but I began thinking about this, and the first thing is that the, I, the concept of joy itself because we usually use terms like joy and happiness uh, interchangeably, but actually within a spiritual context, they're not the same. 
Happiness is, as, has, as we've heard earlier, is emotional, it's ephemeral. It's related to something which is easily taken away. So let's say, for example, that you buy a great home. It's in a great neighborhood, it has a great kitchen, great garage. It's got a great white picket fence that surrounds it. One day there's a huge thunderstorm and a great big oak tree falls on your garage and your picket fence. Well, so much for your happiness. Okay, you've had some damage to your place. Kokoleth in the book of Ecclesiastes had the same experience. Right at the beginning of the book, he tells us, I have seen all things that are under the sun, and all is vanity, and a chase after wind. And in case you didn't hear it, he repeats it in chapter 2. All was vanity, and a chase after wind. What he's talking about is purchasing a home with a white picket fence and not being able to hold on to the happiness that he originally felt. So spiritually speaking, joy is distinct from happiness. To experience joy, we first have to know what it is. So joy is connected to one's inner being. It's connected to our soul. It persists through difficult times when we're sick. It persists through poverty. It persists through suffering. Indeed, it persists even if you're dying, even if you're dying on a cross. Because joy is one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Now, all of you have heard about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Those are the ones that you get at your baptism, that are strengthened at confirmation, wisdom, understanding, right judgment, and the rest of them. But you may not be as familiar with the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, generosity, gentleness, faithfulness, modesty, self-control, chastity. Fruits are the byproducts of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. They're about living in right relationship with God. So to the extent that we live in right relationship with God, we have the fruits of the Holy Spirit. And our task is to open the door to the Holy Spirit to let him in, which is the reason I wanted you to have one of these cards. This card is an icon that is, that is related to, one of the, to a part of the book of Revelations. But if you notice this card, it's our Lord try, beginning to knock on a door. But there's something unusual about the door. The door has no handle on it. Can you see that? The door can only be opened from the inside. So we need to think about our relationships here, our relationship with our Lord. Now, relationships, as we've been hearing this evening, are vital for all people. And I'd like to give you a little bit of information about a, a philosopher. I don't want to bore you, you know, too much, but his, his name was Bernard Lonergan. And he was a Jesuit philosopher, a rather famous Jesuit philosopher that died, I think, back in the 80s or so. And he had a little visual image to help us think about relationships. He said, imagine you are the only person on the earth. There's nobody else, no other people. You have plenty to eat. There's a lot of beautiful things around to see. You can walk wherever you want. There's never any concern about anything in terms of danger, but you have no family, no friends, no strangers. You're totally alone. And as a matter of fact, you're so alone that you don't even know you're alone because you've never met another person. In that hypothetical situation, you wouldn't even know you're human. Our sense of ourselves comes from other people. Remember that old Barbara Streisand song, People Who Need People? Well, we all need people. <laughs> There's all of us that need people. There's no one that, that is an exception to that. Our identity, our humanity is formed in relationship to each other. You know you are a husband or a wife because your marriage informs you that that's who you are. 
Likewise, you know you're a parent because your, your children, in a sense, tell you. My pastor tells me I'm a deacon when he asks me to wax his car. <laughs> you know, but the more intimate our relationships, the thicker the identity gets. We learn more about who we are. I knew I was a father when my wife told me she was pregnant. But it took more than that to really get the thickness to the relationship, right? Any of you that have kids know that as time goes by, okay, you become more the mother, more the father. The relationship has a thickness to it. So our identities are formed in various relationships. They come from various people that we meet along the way. Also, we inform other people who they are in our relationships. It's not just us. So if we treat people in a loving manner, we tell them something about themselves. We tell them they are lovable. If we don't tell them we love them or treat them as though we don't love them, well, then they don't know they're lovable, at least not from us. So our relationships are vital to us. God has made us for relationships. We're created for relationships with each other, but we're specially created for our relationship with God. God makes us for a special kind of companionship with us. But sometimes the door to our heart is closed. And we need to open that door for Christ to come in. We are to utilize the gifts that we've received by virtue of our baptism, strengthen our confirmation, so that we can begin to bear fruit. And there's a feedback for this when we do it. We develop a sense of joy. These signs, these fruits of the Holy Spirit are a sign of holiness. Remember when Jesus told us, be, be holy as, my, as your heavenly Father is holy? It's not just for canonized saints, folks. It's for us. And you say, well, you mean, you mean someone like Mother Teresa or St. John Paul II. No, I'm talking about you. In your own parish, you know holy people. Think about it for a minute. You have people in your lives that are holy people. You can tell that these people are holy by their love, their joy, their peace. Nothing is more beautiful than the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Holiness is attractive. We like people who are holy. Now, there are many ways to strengthen our relationship with Jesus. During Lent, for example, we always talk about almsgiving, almsgiving and fasting, especially acts of charity. Even small ones help. But I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about prayer. In the Gospel of Luke, which we are hearing in our cycle this year at Mass and Sundays, Jesus is always praying. Jesus prays more in the Gospel of Luke than in any other Gospel. He prays in fields. He prays at meals. He prays on mountains. He prays on the cross. He prays when he's alone. He prays when he's at supper. He's always praying. He's always staying in touch with his Father. Our relationship with God also depends on prayer. Much has been written about it. There are books and books written about it. A lot of the books talk about methods. We have Liturgy of the Hours. John and I talk about, we have the breviary that we say, Father, that we say every day. There's the Rosary. There's Centering Prayer. There's Lexio Divina. There's Novenas, Daily Mass, Adoration and so on. There's all these different kinds of how-to-do books about prayer. But the most important aspect about prayer is to show up. You have to show up every day. Pray a rosary. Do morning prayer. Read the, the gospel for the day and think about it. Pray on it. Talk to God. Talk to him about what's on your mind your worries, your gratitude, your plans, your disappointments. Talk, about him, talk to him about what you're going to have for supper, whatever. <laughs> okay, spend some time and show up in your relationship uh, with our Lord. Pray during the day. Turn your attention occasionally to God during the day. Pray while you're driving. Turn your attention to him when you're at work, while you're making supper, 
while you're emptying the dishwasher. Pray for yourself, pray for your family, pray for your friends, pray for anyone you know that needs to be prayed for. Spend some time with God and show up. Allow your relationship with our Lord to thicken. And then occasionally remember to quiet yourself and listen a bit. Not with your ears, but with your heart. Because our Lord is nearby, and he's knocking. He's knocking for you. And you'll discover that finding joy is no more complicated than opening a door. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Uh, I have some questions here, and again, we'll invite people to uh, submit additional questions. If you uh, have a card, you can raise your hand or give it to one of the volunteers. Maria, let's start with you. Uh, do you find that many children are overdiagnosed? Uh, that's a tough one. Um, I guess the short answer would be yes. Um, but again, my perspective, you know, I don't want to say that with disrespect or disregard for the legitimacy of so many, you know. Um, the case that I gave you was a, a pretty extreme one um, of, of Chris, who had, you know, four diagnoses that I don't believe actually belong to him. Um, I think we probably, for the last 15 years, were quick to diagnose and stick a label um, and and there was just a trend with that especially particularly ADHD was a big thing um, you can see ADHD on a brain scan so that's one that you can't really it, not that anybody would take the time most people don't have the resources to get a brain scan but um, now I'm rambling <clears throat> see what a complicated question that is <laughs> It's, it's, so, it's so hard to expand on it. I, I would have to say from my perspective, yes. Uh, from my perspective, because I focus so much on relationships and quality relationships, I think we can do better at making a diagnosis more of a last resort, making medication a last resort. And that is what happens when I get somebody in my office that is got a diagnosis and on medication. I almost sort of assume that it's not valid until I seek every single other opportunity and resource and, and sort of pathway to determine, okay, this is actually legitimate. So I'll start, when I get somebody, it's, how's your family life? How's your social life? How's your education? How's your career? And I look to all those areas first before I'm willing to say, yep, this diagnosis is legitimate. So I hope I answered that. Thank you, Maria. Uh, Diane, uh, technology is being used uh, in our studies. Uh, but how do you find that technology and smartphones and various devices are affecting uh, the learning and perhaps distractions at school? I find that uh, social media um, phones are a huge distraction in our schools. Um, we hear, I think it's a myth, that we say that students use their phones and technology as a learning tool. Yes, you can, but that's minimal. I think most parents would be shocked to know how much instructional time is lost to cell phones. Um, students using their cell phones inappropriately and teachers attempting to deal with cell phones. Um, behavioral expectations in the classroom so frequently deal with cell phone use. Um, it becomes difficult to enforce for some teachers because students are adamant about using and keeping their cell phones. That doesn't mean they should be there and it doesn't mean it can't be done. Um, I could also give you um, some extreme cases. Um, I, I believe it's interfering with education. They should not be allowed in the classroom. So that is my opinion. Just leave them at the door, don't bring them in. They should not be in sight. There should be a very strict rule. Um, a teacher recently told me that another um, impact of cell phones is that um, bullying, um, fights in the school, um, distractions in the school, um, students are sending messages during class time 
to distract teachers. Um, a fight is going on with one area in the building where a far more serious incident of bullying is happening in another area. Um, students are involved in negative activities with the social media. Um, I had um, interns who did some research with students. It's amazing what students are sharing on social media. Um, do they feel safer? Do they see, feel anonymous um, by using social media? They're definitely not. Um, I would say that it's something we need to address as parents, as teachers, as administrators, the negative impacts of, um, of phones in the classroom and social media. And here's a follow-up question. How can parents help a child who is being bullied? I think, again, it's the conversation. It's listening. It's listening to their friends. It's listening to their child. Um, somebody else besides that child knows that the bullying is going on. Um, it's being there to listen. Um, it doesn't happen overnight. If you don't have that relationship, it's hard to start it. Um, so we need to, first of all, be aware that our children can tell us those things. They may not be able to tell us at that moment when we ask the question, but we could open the door to say, when you're ready to talk, I'm here. Give them an option. Is there somebody else that you'd feel comfortable talking with? Do you want to talk to an aunt, an uncle, a friend, a neighbor? Um, just always keeping that open and checking at school, staying involved, asking teachers, what do you see? Is there a change in behavior? Is a difference? What's happening at lunch? What's happening on the playground? Um, talk to friends. You don't have to ask direct questions, but you could see what's happening. Talk to other parents. Um, as I said, there's somebody, there's many persons who knows what's happening. We have to find who that person is and help that child know that we're there to support them, that we are much stronger than the bully. And it's, it's hard for students to believe that the bully has no power, that the bully is not the strong one in the situation. We need to keep giving that message until they believe it. Stephanie? My boss is my daughter's age. I find myself being maternal. How can I deal with this, and what should the boundaries look like? Are you asking the question from the maternal angle or the... Well, it says, Child. here's the question. My boss is my daughter's age, mm -hmm. and the employee who, who has a boss who's much younger mm -hmm. uh, is having uh, um, issues, it sounds like, with, mm -hmm. with the boss, and she wants to mother uh, the, uh, the boss and mm -hmm. wondering if you have any advice or guidance. Sure. I think what's important to remember in this situation, as I mentioned in the beginning of my presentation, is that we're all working with three generations. And I think mutual respect for each, each generation brings something very important and valuable to the table. And I think um, giving or taking the time to truly understand where they're coming from. And, and in a situation like this, too, it's, it's, you can talk to your uh, child at home and, and maybe get some feedback from them on how they might handle the same situation at their place of employment. Um, but I do think it's a mutual respect and, and just being professional. Uh, and Stephanie, uh, the, another uh, person uh, observes that there are some people who seem to enjoy pain and failure. And you've, Stephanie, worked at my law firm that I've been at for decades, does a wonderful job dealing with lawyers, support staff, uh, from top to bottom. How do you deal with situations where someone seems to take joy in another person failing or, or not doing well? Sure. Well, here again, uh, and I tell, I talk to a lot of employees, and, and employee counseling is something that I do. There are varying personalities and varying work styles, and where what you may perceive that someone is taking enjoyment in uh, something negative may just be their personality. And, and, and if they truly are taking enjoyment in something that's negative, that's really their problem, and you shouldn't give it any energy or effort or um, take stake in anything that they have to say. Thank you. Deacon Greg, um, please uh, give an example of prayer, talking with God, something that you think might be helpful to uh, someone uh, looking for new ways to pray. 
I think it depends on you, on the individual. Everyone has a different style that they pursue. So, there's a, a have you ever heard of Thomas Keating? Thomas Keating was a uh, Trappist monk. Actually, I think he may have been a Carthusian monk who wrote extensively on centering prayer. And he produced, he has produced, he just recently passed away. Keating was an elderly man. And so I've listened to some of his tapes and I tried centering prayer and I couldn't do it. <laughs> you know, it just wasn't in me, okay, to pursue centering prayer. Uh, and so some years ago, I was in a bookstore in Elmira, New York, and I came across this book. It's called Christian Prayer. Some of you may be familiar with it. What it is, it's a one-volume breviary. So it includes morning and evening prayer. And I bought it, and I, I uh, fell in love with the format and the Psalms, which is the basis for morning and evening prayer. I had a grandfather who said a rosary every day of his life. He loved the rosary. So did my mother. There's diff there are different ways of, uh, of approaching prayer. And some people like Lexio Divina. You have to experiment a little bit to find what you prefer. And you've got to give it some time. God will meet you in whatever format you want to be you're willing to meet him. So you just have to try out some things until you find something uh, that is comfortable. Whether And you need to do it regularly, every day. St. Francis de Sales said you should spend 30 minutes in prayer each morning, except when you're busy. <laughs> then you should spend an hour. <laughs> so you need, to have, you need to have some time and give it... And give it uh, to show up and to give it some uh, uh, weight in your life. Can you comment about uh, adoration and uh, if that's uh, effective? And are there any studies that show uh, what uh, adoration of the Blessed Sacrament uh, you know, has as an effect? You know, we've had, uh, with, with kids, we had a, at St. Richard, we had a school for many, many years. And uh, uh, when you observe, one of the things about the kids is they loved adoration. <laughs> they really enjoyed it. You know, they, they enjoyed the time there. It was kind of an unusual experience. Our bishop, Bishop Nelson Perez, says that you never leave the Blessed Sacrament unchanged as a person. It will change you. So a lot of these things, you know, they're, they're easy to talk about. You have to try it yourself. And you have to do it regularly enough to realize the change that's happening within you. So, like, if you were to, to go on a course of prayer, pick something that you like, like I mentioned a moment ago, and do it for six months. See what you think after six months. I guarantee you that you'll be a changed person. Thank you. Uh, Maria. Hi. Uh, as a parent of multiple children, how can I bring or teach joy to my children uh, in, in connection with the chores we ask them to do and, and taking on more responsibility? Ooh. <laughs> Is that possible? <laughs> um, I think if you raise your children and start off with a value system that we are a family and we all contribute and we do this together um, and encourage family time. You know, if you have multiple children, then your children fight because that just comes with having a sibling. Um, so I would say part of that would be to not create an environment of competition, you know, in celebrate your children for their strengths and differences don't point them out why aren't you like Johnny why you should do you should clean better than Susie and you know sort of create competition like that I think is is counterproductive um, but to encourage them and to get them to want to do chores uh, 
I think if they know that this is just how it is in our family and that we all work together and contribute together, that's going to be a big part of it. I certainly think positive reinforcement. Um, you know, if you get this done, we'll be able to go to your favorite ice cream place or, um, you know, some kind of celebratory event afterwards just to encourage it and make it more enjoyable and not so dreaded. Is that, did I answer the question? Yeah, I think so, thank you. Uh, Diane, uh, if a parent thinks a, a child may have learning difficulties, what should the parent do? Our schools today are um, highly equipped with counselors, psychologists, um, to help identify those problems. And so I would say, um, I don't know of any school district that does not have those services. Some of them take a little longer to get to than others, um, depending on their resources, which gets into the um, social justice issue. But I would say the first step that you should take is within the, within the school. Um, be vocal, be your child's advocate. Um, your child needs to know that you are their advocate in school, so I would definitely um, be consistent in speaking with teachers, administrators, and counselors. Um, if that route is not successful, or you would choose to, there's also the private route. Um, there are many um, counseling services, um, specialists, um, doctors that um, will have that diagnosis. It is a clinical diagnosis. It's a medical diagnosis um, along with um, a behavior or academic. But um, two choices, the schools or the private. But I would suggest um, to start with the schools. Stephanie, uh, we hear a lot about work-life balance. And uh, can you please comment on that and how that uh, affects uh, what goes on in the workplace and uh, uh, the uh, success uh, or lack thereof of the employment relationship and, and the enterprise of the company or business? Lately, uh, in the last maybe five, six, seven years, I've seen a trend um, in at least corporate America where people are, employees are given the opportunity to specifically because of technology, uh, to do some of their work from home. Um, we, for years, have had maternity leave, and that has now expanded to paternity leave and family leave. And I, I do see a lot more people taking advantage of that. Um, I personally haven't seen any issues with people that I work with who have taken advantage of that, um, wherein they have taken advantage of it. I think it works well for everyone, and uh, they will tell you that when they're afforded the opportunity to spend some of their time away from the office and, and more with their family, they're going to be more productive. Thank you. Greg, uh, I sense that many of my prayers are not being answered. What should I do? Could I have an easier question, please? <laughs> Prayers are answered. All prayers are answered. Our, our faith tells us that all our prayers are answered, and that's the key word, faith. Because when, when we're talking to God, God will do whatever is in our best interest. That's called divine providence. So with, in divine providence, God will do what's best for us. What's best for us may not be what we want. And, you know, that's, that's a tough sell when people are suffering and struggling. But we don't have the whole picture right now, do we? We don't have the whole picture. Later on, you know, we will have the whole picture. Uh, when, when God's plan is uh, fully revealed. So our prayers are answered, the answer to that question is. But I, I know that's a difficult thing for all of us from time to time. And it's a matter of faith, having faith that God is acting in our best interest. Maria, this uh, person uh, is uh, an addiction uh, problem, but the person has overcome it through uh, going to weekly meetings and, and meeting new people. But addiction seems to be looked down upon in society, and this person is wondering that uh, uh, how, how can we 
uh, enlighten people and help them better understand that uh, addicts are really like the rest of us, and this is something that, that uh, we should not be judging them for in harshly. Gosh, absolutely. And not so close, probably. Okay. <laughs> I'm Italian. <laughs> I'm loud. No, I'm kidding. Um, that is a, that is a huge question and a very important question. And I even I'm sure everybody in this room has somebody in their family or a group of friends who has addiction. So um, there is an unfortunate label. I think that we are getting better um, because so many people are so touched by it that you're forced to look at it differently when it hits your own family or circle of friends. Um, certainly, joining support groups. Um, AA, obviously, is, is tremendous in terms of the resources and, and support that provides. It becomes like a second family. Um, what's interesting, though, and again, my perspective, is, is always skewed towards relationships as um, there's a big part of me that views addiction as almost an attachment disorder or the, like almost like a relationship where you're either unhappy with yourself, you've got symptoms, um, that you haven't been able to manage and quite often turn to the substance to sort of manage whether it's anxiety or depression. Um, if you were able to use the resources, the people in your life um, to help with those symptoms, it, it, I think you get the same sense almost of high, for lack of a better word, from the support of, of secure attachments and relationships than you do from the substance. So it's a, it's a trick that the substance is there for you and supporting you and helping you with your symptoms. When you turn to the people that matter most to you, um, your family, your friends, your loved ones, and also those that are additional support in the addiction industry. And I might add something. Greg and I were in the seminary at the same time uh, in our diaconate studies, and one thing we learned is our language can make a difference, too. You shouldn't really even talk about an addict or an alcoholic, a person who struggles with alcoholism, a person who has a drug issue. You don't label them as an addict or an alcoholic. That's really uh, an unkind uh, and inappropriate way to refer to someone. So you need to recognize the dignity of the person and start with the description, a person who has this issue, because we all have issues. Uh, Diane, what's your view of helicopter parents? <laughs> it's a matter of the right time and the right place. There are times when our children need us to be helicopter parents, and if we ignore that responsibility, um, the consequences can be with um, beyond the realm of our children to handle that. The problem happens when we don't land the helicopter. You have to know when to move back as well. Students um, need to fail. They need to learn. They need to have challenges. Um, they need to grow from those. Um, and that's where the relationships come in. Um, you don't have to be a helicopter parent if you're confident in their relationships with their peers, with their teachers, um, with their faith community at their church. Um, you can know that they're out of your sight and they're still in a good place. Not that they're always going to make the perfect choice or not that everything's always going to go smoothly, but um, it's a learning experience that's still safe, that's still positive. So I would say that um, focus on the relationships. Look at what's happening. But if need be, um, don't relinquish that responsibility to be a helicopter parent. Just don't overuse it. Stephanie, and I hesitate to ask this question, but I'm going to do it. <laughs> Is it possible to find joy working for lawyers? <laughs> The quick answer is yes. Uh, <laughs> I have done this for over 20 years, and I have a very special place in my heart and elsewhere for lawyers. Um, it does take a special kind of person who can really embrace and, and work with varying styles. I work with very type A, well, most of you are type A, uh, uh -huh. but some more type A, triple A than others. <laughs> And um, I, I love it. I do enjoy it. I think it takes um, the ability to be able to see everyone as an individual and know that everyone is different and brings something special, not to, no, to, to the workforce, but to you as an individual. 
Greg, uh, what does uh, the prodigal son parable tell us about uh, happiness versus joy? I think physicians, by the way, might have a different answer to the question about attorneys. <laughs> <laughs> but um, again, with happiness and joy, that, that's a, a good case in point because the Samaritan who stopped uh, was an individual who decided to take care of someone at personal cost, right? Was that a happy occasion for him? Uh, did I say Samaritan or a prodigal son is the question? Oh, Maybe I misspoke. Prodigal, son, prodigal son. Okay, prodigal son. Well, that's another uh, pretty much a kind of a parallel kind of example. If, you're, if your child leaves you, do you think the father was, was happy? Probably not, right? As a matter of fact, he yearned for the, for the son who had left him. He had a sense of joy. He loved his son. And the son had drifted away and squandered his inheritance. Later on, of course, we know that the son returns. So the happiness, the happiness would have faded for that father for the length of time that the son was away. But the sense of joy of having a son a son that he loved would have been persistent throughout the entire episode. Uh, I'm going to ask now the volunteers to pass out these little evaluation forms. We uh, asked people to tell us what was good, bad, ugly, what we could do better. So it's really helpful to us. And we'll take uh, one or two more questions as we're asking you to fill that out. Stephanie, what do you look for in a new hire? Well, the first thing I look for is to make sure that the candidate has the um, qualifications and skills to fill the position. Um, but then the second part of that in vetting all the resumes and possible phone interviews is in the actual person-to-person -person interview and making sure that they're a good fit. And what I mean by that is, it, specifically in my firm, is there is a culture that is attached to every workplace. And it's important to bring new employees in that can mesh with the culture and be a good fit. Maria, do you think that parents want fixes instead of working with their children? Yes. <laughs> the end. No. Uh, yeah, that, that's, that's a great question, and it's something that happens to me probably every week where, you know, I get my little intake sheet of what's, what's going on, and it's usually very similar to the case I presented, you know, something's wrong with my daughter or son, please fix them. And when I meet with their daughter or son, generally one of the first questions I ask is, of course, how are their relationships at home? And I would say nine times out of 10, there's something there. Um, and what we tend to believe is that the child with the symptoms or the identified patient is, is purposefully or not knowingly, but, but subconsciously developing symptoms to draw attention to the family, to say, hey, there's an issue here. And I would, like I said, nine times out of 10, it's not the child uh, that is exuding the symptoms that is causing the problems, but the family system that they are within that is having some kind of issue or breakdown, uh, whether it's issues between mom and dad within the marriage or issues amongst the siblings or the whole family. So um, yes, and, and quite often parents are surprised when I invite them into therapy and say, this is a family thing, this is not a son or daughter thing. So great question, very relevant. Stephanie, uh, there are privacy, labor regulations. Um, how can uh, personal information be even asked, given all those constraints of the law and the regulations? Are you referring to the interview process? Pardon me? Are you referring to the interview process? The what? The interview, when, you're, when I'm interviewing. Well, or uh, during the course of uh, a person working there, and you think something's going on, how far can you go in inquiring? Sure. So if I suspect that, and again, this is a broad question, uh, we'll use medical, for example. If I suspect that there is something going on with an employee, um, it is actually my obligation to um, 
bring them in and talk to them about what I think might be going on and offer counseling out.